start right now. Okay. So second panel of the night. This is going to be quite a panel, you know. The first panel was discussing the role of linguistics Language. and languages Language. into the formulation of our thought process. But this panel is going to talk about deviance. But it's also going to speak about actually nightlife. nightlife. And what do you do, Aglaé, when you sleep at night? I dream. You dream? Yes. Nice. A lot. Nice, nice, nice. Okay. So since you dream, actually the people that we are going to meet are not dreaming really at night because they are really fully active at night. So with no more ado, we are going to be discussing the celebration and politics and how the two of them fit with each other. We are going to be actually discussing about this tonight and uh, I've just learned that uh, Amsterdam just got her first female mayor uh, selected tonight. So it is a very timely discussion, very, very timely discussion. So perhaps to celebrate this, we are going to have the uh, man that was actually uh, one of the first to create this job title of his Knight Mayor. He used to be the Knight Mayor of Amsterdam for six years. Now he's a global Knight Mayor advocate. He's going all around the world to try and press Cities to also have night mayor, and he's going to tell us all about that. Merrick Milan, come, Merrick. come on stage. This is it, Merrick Milan. And to join Merrick tonight, we are also going to have uh, someone who knows about politics too, and that's going to be actually uh, quite a, a young man, but uh, a young man with incredible, incredible, unique talent, and that is going to be Majid, Majid, Majid here with the Lord Mayor of Sheffield. Ooh. He's 28 years old. He's been elected Mayor of Sheffield, which is a city in the UK. Uh, and uh, you are born in Somalia, am I correct? Yes. And, then that's, and you're working for the Green Party, and that's yes. quite unique, right? Yes. You're the youngest member of the Green Party, but not only that, you're the youngest Mayor pretty much of Europe, right? Yeah. Am I correct? I, I can't. I don't know. I, honestly, you don't. But you're amazing. And you and I, we yeah. met actually uh, at a party during yes. a night time. In, a, in Sheffield International Documentary Festival, pretty much dancing is where we met. And then you just came and like, University Underground, it's amazing. And I was hooked. And now we're here. That's it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And now you're going to... Oh, oh my God. Can I get like a big round of applause for this guy? You know, like no. the youngest man in Europe. No. This is where we need to look up to, you know? Yeah. Indeed, yes, Majid. And then actually to speak about uh, nightlife, someone who has been working within the nightlife for, what, 20 years? More? Like, <laughs> uh, well, basically, performer, producer, all-in-one, incredible human being, fantastic woman, uh. just genuine, supportive, advisory board member of the University oh, of the Underground. Stop. Pitches, yeah. people. Woo! Underground forever. <laughs> that's it. That's the spirit. Uh, and then who else is with us, Aglaé, tonight? Bruce. Bruce Sterling. Bruce yes. Sterling. Bruce Sterling. Where are you, Bruce? Bruce Sterling, yes. science fiction Woo! author. Bruce. Bruce we, Sterling. Uh, we we really need a longer introduction. Science fiction author. <laughs> also a tutor in the University of the Underground. Uh, came to visit us this year. He's going to tell us all about his experience. But uh, now also very important, very important, and actually I'm feeling quite stressed about it. Uh, here is actually our director, the University of the Underground Charity Director, uh, Angelique Spanik here, uh, who is joining Yay! us, who is uh, working at MU. You run your gallery at MU in Eindhoven, and you're also the director of the festival called Stirp, which is Trep. And of stripe. course, you all know Stripe, which is uh, one of the best, really, festival of uh, all. And I mean, I'm a bit biased, and I'm going to say it's actually the best one, really. Uh, but anyway, so I say, do you have no microphone? No, no, there's, the microphone? One, there's one there. No panic, no panic. You can share. Okay. That's it, that's it. Okay, so we discussed it a bit earlier, but we uh, like to interact with all of you. So I'm going to ask, actually, all of our panelists to look at the audience. All right. nice. Don't look at me. I'm going to come and speak to you and look at you in the face. And uh, my doppelganger will also do that, so then at least you see double. Do we Sorry? get an introduction of the doppelganger or not? You're, you're a dinosaur. 
Dianthus, where is Dianthus? Is she hiding? Is she hiding away? Dianthus is our last speaker of the night. Why is Dianthus, my God? Dianthus, Dianthus was going to make a, a special apparition tonight. Is she, is she around? Do we have a, a very unique performer healed, healed from Amsterdam? She's also been here hiding away for 20 years. And now she's just making her way back to us. And where do you come from, Dianthus? Far away. But <laughs> how far away? And you are actually bringing some video camera components. Yeah, we have a live uh, connection to the oh, other side. A live connection? So to maybe the you can wave to the people. This is, uh, so we are talking to who here? To the other side. Mm, that's all you need to know. Well, okay. Well, I mean, the bottom line is we love to speak to the other side. Uh, you know, we are based in different level of the world. In the basement, in the nightclub, you know, everywhere. So, Diane Tuss, you're going to be joining us tonight as well. I guess you're here now. Please uh, go around, do, uh, do your thing. I know you wanted to kind of move around and be flexible, but we definitely want to hear you and what you have to say about celebration tonight. Anyway, you with know, no more ado... Nelly, we got to figure out this dynamic here. Now I've got my I'd bags. Say, so I'd say to you, actually... I think we should take the chairs yes, away. Like, yeah. Put me the chair on the floor. Actually, let's get the audience member on one of these chairs. Let's get some special people in this chair. Come uh, on. Are we supposed to be And then you're actually the going to address these people. Yes, yes. Oh. Oh, you want to keep your seat? You can keep your seat as well, but it's kind of a bit more, you know, like your wife, Jasmine, I'm, I'm saying... I'm an old man. Yeah. You, okay, keep it, keep it then. Yeah. Keep it. That's fine, that's fine. Okay, let's yeah, see how that This is also that really looks. nightlife. Eh? People that take control and set the stage. Yeah. Voila, beautiful, beautiful. I okay. Think we do some break dancing. So, guys. this panel is about celebration and politics, but before we get into politics. <coughs> well, I'm trying to work this it out. Is yeah, it, we still know, have our backs to people, though. So. How can we work, just walk around? Tell, Is that well, what we what, do? but lo look at them. They want to really see you. Yeah, here, here. You see? That's it. Yes, that's yes, but then we're not like, how can we all, you know what I mean? Then we. Uh, I actually totally agree yeah. with this. This is a, an so experiment. It's a bit awkward. So, ma see. so maybe, the, so maybe the person that speaks can stand in the middle of the circle. Yes. And look um, around. And beautiful, and beautiful, Merrick. Beautiful. You see, the man has been promoting event for like about 20 <laughs> years as well. So he knows his stuff. He knows his stuff. Okay, Mirek. Okay. Nearest. Pitches, can you tell us what you dream of at night? Oh, it's funny. Well, I dream a lot about um, community spaces, which is really strange. But they're never clubs or anything like that. They're always... Th and actually, a good friend of mine also has this dream about community spaces, walking in with other people. But to him, it's completely terrifying. And to me, it's like home. Does anybody have these kind of dreams where it's... I've had them since I was 16. Always like it's some community space. So weird. Does anybody share my <laughs> pain <laughs> right now? A anyone dreaming of community space here? Maybe you don't think of it as community space. Hey, when, you, when you dream, do you dream of pe only people you know? Well, I definitely am dreaming all the time about community space. Like yeah, I like it's, uh, but it's, I, uh, it's I not even people I, I know. But in my dream, I know them, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I, feel, I feel the, the emotion there, for sure. And it, it's, a, it's, it's like a home or a happy place, and they're all different. But uh, no, just Nelly, who's lying to, to make me no, feel no, no, more no, comfortable I, I about actually, talking I about do, this. I do, I do. I mean, it's like, you know, the University of Zenergon has been pretty much waking up you know, wake me up at night for 10 years. So, you know, it was time to make yeah. it happen eventually. So you think that, that those dreams propelled th Actions. those communities? Yeah, sometimes they do. Yeah, yeah. Think. Yes, for yeah. sure, for it, sure. It, it definitely What created this community space. Did you, I mean, Majid, perhaps, did you ever dream that you would become the mayor of Sheffield? I mean, Sheffield amongst all place. I mean, do you know about Sheffield people? I'll tell a yeah. quick, a quick fact yes. about Sheffield. Now we know about Sheffield because Majid is a yes. mayor of Sheffield. Very topical fact about Sheffield. Sheffield is where football started. It's the oldest football club in the world. It's where football was actually founded from. So it's a lot of history around football in Sheffield. Very fitting with the World Cup. And we're known as Steel City. We used to mass produce most amount of steel in the world. So very industrial city. Population of about 650,000 people. So fairly decent sized people. So pretty cool. And so, did you yeah. dream of... Uh, did I? 
That's what? for you. It was all about the football and uh, no, you just. Did I ever dream about being like, in, in all honesty? That's the like, way. When I was young, I wanted to be an elephant. Like I had no, like I literally had no political ambitions. Are you no saying this because ambitions. I'm called Nelly? No. Is it why? You Nelly? know, because in the UK they have this no. uh, animation no. film that is called Nelly and the Elephant. No, I I didn't even know about that myself, to be honest. Yeah. yeah. But no, I just. You wanted to be an elephant. No, what I'm trying to get is. I just basically just wanted to make a difference in where I live, with the community I actually lived. And I kind of thought, well, if you didn't do politics, politics would do you. And it was a case of the people that we elected to represent us didn't reflect those people that they actually represented. And it goes in so many dif different forms of government, whether that be local governments to national governments. So I kind of thought, I'll just throw myself in that and then see what happens. And I had a lot of support. It happened. It happened. And it happened. But and now I'm here, so... That <laughs> is such an incredible statement that you just said, though. If yeah. you don't get involved in politics, politics will get you. That's, yeah. that's really important, I, I, I think, for anybody. And it's true, and even, like, you know, um, within, the, say, for example, in the, the nighttime economy, there's a lot of the kind of, like, politicians and the MPs or councillors, they don't necessarily get involved in the nighttime economy. They tend to be mainly from a certain demographic, they're mainly in bed by 10 o'clock because yeah. they're doing the kind of shift like back to work the next day. So they don't really understand the needs of the people in the nighttime economy. So it's hard for them, for them, for them to actually make decisions for when it comes to party culture and actually make a real meaningful difference if they're not part of it. And I think that's why it's really important to have night mayors because they really play a crucial role. And I think every major city should have a night mayor. But I mean, in your case, you're also awake at night. I mean, I, I witnessed yeah. that. <laughs> Well, this is what it is. It's like if, if I <laughs> have to represent as many people as possible, I will be out partying with you till early hours of the morning, oh. waking up early and basically just doing what I can. Okay, okay great. Angelique, do you want to chime in and tell us about your experience of celebration? Because you are not, cele I mean, you're celebrating as well at night, but strip and what is the festival has been developing through the years yeah. and how do they understand in a way this nightlife and this audience? And how do you actually include politics into the way that you develop the festival every year? Oh, well, you have to do a lot of politics to do a big festival like that. It's mm. every two years, it's a biennial. It has been, and now it's becoming uh, a yearly thing again and with pop-ups. So we want to infuse nightlife a little bit more. We have a nightmare uh, uh, since a mo three months or so. Yeah, really short. Yeah, yeah which is a, it's a, he's a really nice guy, so he's, he's pumping up the ideas in, in Eindhoven to, to make it happen again. But I think nightlife kind of fell back quite a bit. Um, and with a festival, you cannot keep it up. So you need more people, more venues, small venues. And what I think, like, the, the, the old people, in, uh, um, uh, they have children. So they should know about nightlife. They should talk about it, or the, the kids should talk about it. It's not only for young people anymore, I think. So that's also something that is, I think is very important to engage everyone, that nightlife is important to be a city, to, um, and, and to have a cultural heart that beats all the time. It's not dead at night. I don't dream a lot, but I used to dream a lot that I, would f that I could fly. And I still hope that comes back. So that's also something, I think, with nightlife, it has to fly. Maybe I we can make that happen at the University of the Underground, right? I'm sure one of the students can make a, a flying machine for you, Angelique. Yes. yes. I'm can sure. I, can I, I just do a survey yes. for one second? How many people in this room have actually gotten off the ground and flown in their dream? I really haven't. 90%. 85. <coughs> Never. I want that. And um, I mean, Bruce, can you chime in here? Because I know that you write at night. So you're a science fiction author. I mean, you've been writing how many books to date, uh, Bruce? I don't count them. <laughs> uh, but you had this you obsession I... for Sarkozy uh, lately. Yeah, well, I can tell you what I dream and about. And Carla Bruni, you and I have got this kind of like thing. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, you well, always. I, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I dream about travel. You dream I, about I'm, travel? I'm a travel writer and an emigre. So when I dream, it's usually stuff like train stations, border checks, misplacing the luggage, wondering what was on trains, auto, you know, not automobiles, jets, but it's about being mobile on the planet's surface. When I'm asleep, I'm usually moving. 
And you know, I, I'm from Austin, Texas, which is a town that has a very heavy-duty nightlife. And I used to headbang quite a lot. Uh, but I don't really do that now. Instead, I like to go to places like Ibiza, where there's a huge nightlife, and then just not go out. Like, I, I like to go to Ibiza and write novels. And, you know, and the other thing about night that I think is sort of super interesting from a contemporary perspective is like different global time zones. Like, I'm writing stuff on the internet, and there's somebody like nine time zones away, and I'm like knowing they're asleep, and that they're like gonna wake up and see what I said, and it's gonna like just hit them from some other section of the planet. Just like, I mean, yeah. Um, that and jet lag. Jet lag, I think, is like the kind of ultimate nightlife feeling. Because you're not like awake or sleepy, you're just in the wrong time, right? Just you're like visiting at like the wrong space. And does and it make you also more creative? You know, I, I do that. You know, I take a lot of melatonin. I mean, I don't, I don't like pop MDMA, you know. Well, I'm we have like, some Coca-Cola like here. Can we so get some Coca-Cola for Bruxelles? Who has got some Coca-Cola? If you're into jet front? lag, trust me some here, melatonin is your friend. Really. I mean, melatonin will unhinge you from the passage of time mm. in some way that you just... It's, it's a powerful drug, okay? It's a hormone. It doesn't make you high, but it really, like, just pushes you into the past or future, right? It's just like, I'm not there yet. You know, or I, I kind of was there. I should be asleep, but I don't feel like it. Or I don't feel like sleeping, and now I can. And yeah, it's, it's quite an extraordinary Experience. I don't know, substance. Yeah. How mood, about you, mood Dianthus? altering substance. Dianthus, do you dream at night? Where are you from, Dianthus? Because I, we I, don't even I, know where I, you're I, from. I, it doesn't matter, no? I, 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 I dream <laughs> every night. You dream every night? I have a dream book. Ah, uh, yes? So when I go to sleep, I flip the pages. And then I'm like, no, no, yes, yeah, sleep, yeah, no, yeah. And then <laughs> I, off I go. And Last you, night I dreamt you about, go where uh, exactly? I, I dreamt about a miniature rabbit. Miniature rabbit, I was going to get one for my niece. And uh, they fit in your hand, they're as big as this camera. And uh, yeah, I'm a bit stressed out, but I think I should share this. So I'm, when I buy a rabbit, I call the mother. She's like, no, it doesn't fit my couch. The hairs will fuck up the couch. I find another one, a white one. No, the legs will get yellow when it gets old. So I start to dream about it. Like I was in this cage with all this talk about community space in the cage with the rabbit. So yeah, rabbit. And do you use this rabbit. in your work? Yes. So you're a performer artist, yeah, right? I'm a performance artist. And so do you use your dream then afterwards into your practice? Yeah, right away, actually. So you dream and then straight away, bam, performance yeah. next day. Yeah. Okay, that's quite fast. That's why I'm also here, talk about different time uh, frames. I'm with the program, sister. I'm, I'm liking that. I saw that. your, I saw it. <laughs> So, and what about you? I mean, you have been not sleeping for six years, basically. Yeah. Yeah. As a nightmare of Amsterdam for six years, you just didn't sleep. No, for sure. Um, but now, now it's a new life for you, Merrick. I mean, I'm just wondering how you survive being a, a night yeah, no, mayor what I, what and I then think, not be a night mayor anymore. What I think is important, uh, if you want to have a vibrant nightlife, uh, it's really about space, yeah? uh, affordable, affordable space for people to use. It's about talent, of course, about the community, and it's also about making sure that we have less, uh, making sure that we have less rules and regulations, because uh, you can't buy creativity. You, creativity really, you have to nurture it, and you have to bring it together. And 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 these spaces are, are very important for cities, and uh, because they these spaces is what makes cities unique. And it's not like your new. Uh, a coffee chain or department store that's gonna gonna make people want to live in your city and I truly believe that there's a lot of talent development in nightlife for the creative industry and for young creatives and I think that the cities really have to nurture this and really have to bring this together and we were talking about this earlier if I have a dream for nightlife or I, if I have a dream it's that uh, definitely also people in power but also people in general um, realize that 
the night can learn uh, can learn you a lot more than a lot of people think because at night uh, people at least have something in common uh, and that's that they're out at night and I have learned everything I know about uh, inclusivity or uh, gender equality or about LGBT scene about you know I truly believe that a culturally diverse nightlife can lead to a more social and ethnic inclusive city <coughs> Yeah, that's very, very important. And th that they're safe spaces where people feel comfortable to express their, who they are. Yeah. You know, and we were talking about it because uh, the more inclusive it is, the more rich the culture will be for the nightlife. The more, the more you will learn, the more you will understand, the more you will enjoy, the more you will celebrate. Yeah. Think it's... Uh, just touching upon what he was saying, one of the great things about party culture and the nighttime is the fact that you can have whatever political background beliefs you have, whatever religious backgrounds you cover. Everyone is together just to have a good time and enjoy whatever the activity that you're doing in the evening. And literally just the other night, I was out partying, met a lovely lady, had a great time. The following morning, she told me she was a far right wing fascist and had all these, all these, and it's like, but we had an amazing time and everything was all good, but it's, wow. you really, you just everybody kind of has got the wrong background. But I think the beauty of it is, is if we tend to like concentrate on what we kind of have in common rather than what divides us. For example, like one initiative that we did in Sheffield was trying to boost the voter turnout in the local elections. So because that's, it's not as divisive as trying to get people to vote a specific way, but if we're trying to encourage everybody to get registered to vote, especially young people where, in Sheffield there, the kind of least people actually go out and vote. We actually did that through going out to the clubs, getting involved in the nighttime economy to really, because that's, you've got a captive audience right there. And we really use that as a t tool to actually get them involved in local politics. Yeah, because a lot of people always say there's no votes in nightlife, but yeah. there's so many young, progressive, open-minded, forward-thinking people like here, or uh, a lot of people here in the room. And, and uh, these are the people that, need, that you need to capture. And I think this is a really strong message, you know, sending out. So because it's not always boring, you know, we can also, and I definitely, what I really think about. What do you mean it's not always boring? So uh, politics. The, the yeah, politics. No, politics. Because nightlife so usually is not really well like known for being. No, yeah. like in my opinion. <laughs> politics, in my op yes. Now listen, in my, in my, op in my opinion, yeah. um, city politics are um, uh, really so important to be. So tell us how you got listen, into politics. Let me, let me just finish. So city politics <laughs> are being. I don't know. I'd yeah. Great Merrick, ooh la la. So, so city poli politics <laughs> are, in my opinion, in important yeah, to, get to, to, get to get involved in. <laughs> because when something changes, when the mayor changes, now or now we have a new mayor in Amsterdam, uh, Femke Halsema was just announced, which is great. First Woo! female, like what you Woo! said. When the mayor changes, like the, when the mayor changes, it, there, there are things like the 24-hour licenses we installed yeah, here in Amsterdam. Um, uh, that when that changes, that really you really feel it. And nation politics is often that it's about taxes and that's sort of and you don't really feel that in your community space or in your private space. And that's why it's so great. Like um, uh, you, if you, you have, if you have a mayor where you can really be proud of, this can really make a difference in a city. Can I say something? <laughs> yep. I don't think we should always wait on the politicians, with all due respect. I think it's Agreed. amazing. I think we should also just start doing it. And a lot of things are already happening in the nightlife and being political and celebrating. And I think the visibility is that, that is where also a big problem lays, that it's not really visible, also because of sometimes re repercussions. Yeah, that's a good word. But, <laughs> but is it maybe perhaps because nightlife allow you to be more experimental than during daytime? And that maybe you don't tend to think about recording or documenting your nightlife because you try to experiment with method, practice, and, you know, I mean, in your case, but also in your case, speeches. Well, well you know, since how much more experimental is it for you to actually perform at night I, I think as opposed to daytime? Well, yeah. I think uh, since two years, we, I am and, and my uh, partner Coco organize a 12-hour event called Clitterband, which is a contribution to the thinking and talking about the queer collection in art, in museums, and the place that it has or may not have had. 
And I think this is one of the things which is really interesting is that it, it has the setup as a party, but we also have lectures in the night, like 12 hours long, it's full, and people are really waiting for other places. Yeah, I forget, I forget. The <laughs> Hi. Don't, don't forget. Yeah, but yeah, now I'm distracted. But you get my point, yeah. Peaches? Yeah, yeah, I get your point, I get you. I get it. Um, what yours? Yeah. So that is coming out of nowhere, and yeah, I feel always, always. But uh, so you're saying like you feel that people are more oh, no, experimental I'm not at no, night. No, I'm asking you whether or not you think that nightlife allow you to be more experimental in your practice. In my practice, when it's darker, it's quieter. Is it more? Are you more willing to experiment with ideas than when it's daytime where it looks like if there is kind of invisible power and maybe this power disappear at night? Yeah, but it doesn't have to be in a club. It just feels more experimental at night, but it doesn't necessarily have to be in front of other people. I think also being experimental with yourself, you know, takes some time in the day, <laughs> you know? So maybe that is why nightlife is more open or experimental. But what I wanted to touch on is that it's still so complicated in clubs, you know, to be diverse, to be open, to, you know, it, it's, it's fun for us to, to say, like, let's get together, let's do this, this, this. But it, uh, it's, it's super complicated. Even between the, the clubs that have more of the... I, I want to use another word other than diversity, but like inclusivity, or I don't know what, I f just feel none of these words are working anymore, but um, just f a better flow. It just feels like it's, better you know, even vibe. just like with, with, with all, all, you know, like do you have to have a specific night for this or for that, you know, and then does that make it more of a focus on that and that it's not okay on the other nights, you know what I mean? It's also a bit of politics in language, in a way. So it's yeah. di diver diversity and inclusivity are these political words for but things they shouldn't like be. Flow why? Why is together? diversity a, a, a political word? That should be the most unpolitical word, shouldn't it? Yeah, it should just be like the easiest word. By, it doesn't feel like it's ours anymore, or something. I think. You know, I, I anybody can join in too. It's not just uh, you know us talking. If if you think I'm saying bullshit or if anybody is saying bullshit, you know we're trying to like be experimental here too with a sort of you know what you've set up here is is something different and it's not just us talking and you guys going what the fuck's going uh, on. I, you know, I but have if you want to say something. I have a design like problem. A design well, problem. I have a design problem that I think maybe the panel can help me with. Yeah. Or somebody in the room. All right. So I've got this building, which is like kind of a community center, or it used to be, because it's a 375-year-old palace in Turin. So it was an archive and a library, and the guys who were running it like decided to move their archive somewhere else. They're just digitizing it. And we know them, because they're like the Compagnia de San Paolo, who are like big culture industry backers in Torino. So we're like, oh, we really like your palace, and you don't seem to have anybody in it. So is it okay if we like write novels up in the attic? And they're like, yeah, that would be great, Mr. Sterling. So we're now up on the top of this tomb-like, absolutely empty, huge Savoy-era villa. I mean, it's, it's literally a palace, right? Hushed, completely empty. I mean, it's us and a security guard and like some electronic monitors. And like, okay, we want like something to happen in this space. I mean, we're in there typing, which is all right, but you know, something should happen. So we're like, okay, could we have a rave? It's like, no, because why? You know, well, there's a hospice across the street where people are slowly dying and they don't really need any Invite head banging. Them. Invite you them know. over. Yeah, well, yeah, that would be great. You know, it's like, come over kids, have some MDMA on your stretchers. I'm, I'm totally with that. It would be great, and you know the public would love it. 
you know, we could do projection mapping on the thing at night. It's like, it's a building. Let's like put some video on the building. We know tons of, you know, new media people, whatever. But no. So we, is this we, an open invitation for the people yeah, in the well, room you know, we to actually, help you out? We need an experience design. Right? We need, need something to happen in this but building you, that like lifts it from the dead. I think right? you know, the phoenix must be reborn, yeah. right? Somehow it has to become an exciting building. Yeah. I think when we keep saying like night culture and party culture, I think we tend to kind of miss out. You can still, it's not all big raves, parties. You can literally involve all forms of walks of life and literally have something on the evening, whether that be a community cinema night, get everybody. You can have, you can put on really inclusive events where you can invite everybody along, and it is still part of the whole night culture, part of still party culture, but it's not as the, on the extreme as giving kids MDMA. Yeah, well, yeah. You know, I, I think maybe the key here might be to do some kind of experience design that would last a hundred years. Why do you ask? Because them? everybody wants to have the one so blowout party. You mean a university party. of the underground? Yeah, I mean like a design fiction that lasts for yeah, move a that century. Uh, the Nelly. University of Underground could move there and then that'll yeah, be... I mean, yeah, I mean... Absolutely. Bruce, we I'm, I'm sure they'd be happy to have a school in there. Why don't you put an there advert out to the community and just ask them what they want to do with it? Just put an advert out there saying, what would you like oh, to see in the space? They put out a lot of ads. How do you do it, Majid, usually? And if there was so you just put advert like that? I would literally... Would, I would use whatever, like... Whether that be uh, leafleting, using social, all forms, just to basically, if I wanted to, if I had a, sp well, it depends on so many different factors, to be honest. But if you're if you're not sure what to do with it, just I would say ask other people that might can give you lots of ideas. A lot but of people in the room here. Yeah. How do you and, and reach Bruce out to you? And at well dot com. If some, if you have a stroke of genius, don't hesitate to contact me. How can we help him? How do you do it? You do it through your social media? How I, like if, if I was in that sort of, if I'm communicating with people, it depends on what do I'm trying. Do you speech on TV as well as a law mayor? How does yeah, that work? Yeah, well. Like I saw you wearing this big. Gold chain. Like, gold chain. <laughs> yeah. Right. That's like quite unique from, a, yeah, from being a law mayor. Yeah. It's, it's a, she's on about, um, as in law mayor, basically you get a gold chain that's dated since 18 something. It's just part, it comes with the office and you just kind of walk around, walk around with a gold chain. But basically, <laughs> like, honestly, just communicate with people. Like, it depends what I'm tr who I'm trying to, who my target audience are. But if it's something general, I'll just use all forms of media. It, it sounds like room is not, or space is not what people are looking for there. Yeah. So you shouldn't offer the space. You should maybe offer the palace or be a king or something else. Experience. That, that, is, that is needed. Well, it's got to be a heritage industry shtick, you know, because I mean, because Europe is full of disused buildings that are turned into something else. I mean, that's where the creative class hangs out. They're all in the dead bread factory, you know, and, and this is like a dead garden villa, but, you know, a really big one. Uh, so, you know, I'm thinking it's something that probably should be kind of slow and even attached to the building in some way. Mary, right? like, like an intervention you that you could like, tell people, okay, we've like added this thing onto the structure and now you can like go in here and it's going to do something that no other royal palace is doing, right? It could be like an Eno installation. Like we put in ambient music, you know, because Brian Eno <laughs> likes to go to old palaces and he did this Luke's album in Turin. And, I mean, but that's like too easy. And besides, Eno already did it. You know, I want something that like gets to the bone somehow, like, like a ghost would be good. It's oh, like, oh, we're going to oh, haunt history. the building. Miri, right? yeah. It's like Miri, faces it. will be seen at uh, the Miri windows for the next 150 Any, um, years. Chimin, Chimin. No, no, it's like, uh, some things I, I agree and some things I don't agree. I think like, I think like that, uh, uh, that it all starts with having, having, having a proper space. And, and uh, if then, you know, if there are all sorts of restrictions, of course, that will limit your creativity. Um, uh, but... Um, yeah, for, for me, I don't, um, I, w I would say space is key uh, for creating new things. And that's what, um, yeah, that, that's what, what, what in my, my opinion, makes cities unique. And I don't uh, care so much about the fact that um, there's always a discussion between, like, okay, what is, like, creative class and, and, uh, and, and how does it work? Because what we need to be careful about is that, like, um, gentrification of our cities goes really, really quick. 
and we need to protect these creative spaces. And if there are still open space, we need to, instead of just saying, oh, you can have this space for five years or you know, or three years or five years, we should say, why can't we buy this space and give it for uh, a, a, like an, uh, an affordable uh, rate for like 50 years or 80 years? You know, same as what happened in the Holzmarkt in Berlin, which is an, a really interesting project where you can protect this space um, from being in the end gentrified and just uh, um well, used for, yeah. Well, <laughs> well, tell me. I don't know if it was really protected. I mean, there is a lot of creative ideas going on there, but it will never be as raw and as real as as it so was before yeah. but yeah, then maybe no, no. people in, in like that certain area in that you yeah. know, it was very but special but, but, but now it feels no, no, very no, 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 no. but maybe it's too technical tell, tell but the audience about this because yeah. no, okay, it just so feels normalized that's all but yeah, no, so you live in Berlin right? Peaches lives in Berlin Berlin yeah, and you LA. have o on the Spray River all the, all the big companies were all like the uh, Mercedes and BMW and etc they were all uh, uh, buying land on the, uh, the river uh, on the Spray River and one of these uh, uh, properties, I think like 17 or 18 he uh, hectares big, was by bought by a, a sw uh, um, uh, sw uh, Swiss um, investment uh, group. Uh, and they, but at what I understood from the project is that they at least made sure that like the nightclubs and the spots were on there could stay there, and for a very long time. Um, and uh, but of course, after a while, definitely when it's a, a construction like this, it probably loses this really rough feeling, and that's what you're getting at, right? In a way, it's still also institutionalized, and it doesn't have that edge. But otherwise, you will always be pushed more to the edge of the city, and I think it's also good to protect these spaces in our inner city. And so, what do you do, Majid, about that? About the nightlife in Sheffield? I mean, you just started, right? You only yeah. started in May, so I mean, it's like yeah. it's quite fresh. Yeah, only one month in. Yeah, there's when it comes to nightlife in Sheffield. There's, for example, one of the things we're doing is trying to really build relationships between the community residents and certain community groups and the businesses in the nighttime economy because there's a lot of frictions between the residents and and the businesses. So it's kind of tackling that, and it's also just also just promoting it. In all honesty, just saying showing whether that be to the other decision makers, councillors, other kind of invested and um, stakeholders in the city, the importance and value of the nighttime economy and just the party culture has on Sheffield, especially as we pride ourselves to be a really creative, forward thinking city, we need to also kind of back that up by saying, well, this is the actions we're going to take to actually not just survive, but thrive in that space. Do we have any question for our panelists? Any question, Joseph? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, yeah. Behind you. Hi. Hello, hello. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm curious if maybe you're coming at this from the completely wrong direction. So, Peach has opened the whole thing saying who has uh, dreams about community space. Bruce is asking about his space. We have the Night Mayor ask, talking about how important space is. Uh, and I'm wondering if, if, if it's not more important first to talk about community building. If you can build a community and then take it to the space, I think that's the most important thing you can do. I don't have a 370-year-old palace in Turin, but I do have a 350-year-old Krachtpont in, uh, in the Herachacht. And what we did first was build the community, and then we took the community into the building. So if I was going to look at like Bruce's problem, for instance, I would look around at communities that are interesting and then I would invite those communities into my space. Yeah, I think this is a this is a great yeah. example, and I think th I think that's what that's what's coming out of the night culture is community building. It's it's basically people coming together with a common interest. Maybe it's a good time. Uh, maybe it's uh, diversity. Maybe it's uh, music. Whatever it is, but that's that's sort of what builds the community. And once you have the community, that's what comes into the space. Yeah, that's that's what we're doing here. Yeah, yeah, I think so. No, yeah. I, I'm, I'm so not convinced I, that really works because I've kind of seen that happen. Uh -huh. I mean, we have this space in Turin, which is called the Garone Foundry, which is a little bit like the culture brewery in Berlin. But instead of being a dead brewery, it's a dead fiat factory. Uh, so the city gave it over to a bunch of open source guys, you know, pretty much uh, for a song. 
because the building was just an extensive ruin. I mean, just really a wreck. Nobody had been in it since the 1970s. So they came in there and they like put in a fab lab and then they started like lofting out some design offices and then like the Arduino group moved in there. So they, but now it's like become like a little factory. I mean, it's just got light electronics going on and people show up and they're actually just, you know, small scale business people. And the original community of guys who were sort of open source zealots, it's like, give us any place to squat. You know, they've either like gone to work for Fiat or they've like migrated off to China or they're off in Silicon Valley and so forth. And it was the fact that they actually had the building that actually changed the community. Because you sort of knew where to go, right? You had like an office, you had like a mailing thing, you had like, you know, people knew where to find you and suddenly opportunities multiplied and the community just sort of scattered in all directions. And, you know, I don't think that's even bad. Right? But I'm just saying, you know, it's typical to like, you build the, you, we like build our buildings and then our buildings shape us. You know, and, and that place which used to be just kind of almost a, you know, a, a squat is now, I don't know, it's one of the most dynamic places in Turin now. But does it run at night? It does actually. They have a lot of nightlife stuff there. They've got a lot of guys who make really bad electronic music, you know, with like Arduino devices, circuit bender guys, you know, eight bidders. <laughs> yeah, which I find interesting, but it, you know, it's not music. <laughs> I said that just to irritate them, actually. <laughs> to tell you the truth, I fucking love circuit bending 8-bit music. I can't get enough of it. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, every Come SoundCloud on, guy, I follow them. A free, uh, Joseph, where is our, yeah? I like neurofunk, okay? Yeah. I like guys who take no yeah. fucking prisoners. One more question. Yeah, uh, to come back to like uh, politics of space also. Uh, like in the 70s and 80s, you obviously had like a lot of squat movements, which were yeah, anti-governmental, which meant that like now you can have a lot of spaces that fry from this era that create uh, creative realms. And now we have uh, a lot of bureaucracy and law and order that is quite oppressive in a silent domain. And I'm wondering, rather than just saying fuck the police and fuck the government, how can you work with this kind of order to create these? creative uh, domains. You ever read uh, Heert Lovink's book, Cracking the Movement? It's a really great book on Dutch squatter politics. Even guys in Texas know about that book. That's how good that book is. So in my, in my, in my opinion, there's always three steps that you need to take. First one is awareness, making people aware, definitely also in City Hall, making people aware that this space is important. Uh, of course, there's all sort of uh, activistic campaigns you can set up for this. I think the second step is always also education. You also need to educate the people that, that have these spaces about how they can better deal with their local government. So it's not only, on, um, uh, not only explaining to in, in the city hall what, uh, what is important, what you think is important for your community, uh, but it's really, really also about educating yourself on how you can best deal with this space, maybe how you can best deal with neighbors, um, uh, uh, what kind of licenses, etc. you need to have. And the la last point is, I think, is access. Um, because like what I've experienced with, uh, definitely also with city politics, is like you're really out there and you probably are really somebody you can like, you know, uh, send a message on Instagram, you probably get a reaction back. But that's not always when it comes to city politics. It's really often like a really a closed, it's a closed, cl closed gate. It's never, a, if you say, yeah, give me the number of the person that is uh, responsible for the, for, you know, giving out licenses for, for creative space or whatever, you know. They're not going to give you that number. So it's really also about access, bridging the, this gap and making sure that uh, people can create these access points for you. And maybe that is a mayor. That is possible. Uh, so these are the three steps we always take. Always make, uh, make, make sure that people are aware. Make sure that you educate yourself and, and, and find those access points. I think education is a really, really important point in the sense that there is lots of different community groups, creative groups, that just don't know how the system works. And why should they? Because yeah. they've never been in a situation where they they're trying their to get bubble, a building. Yeah. Exactly. So whether it's they just need to be given the skills and the tools to actually best achieve what they do what they want to kind of get out. But at the same time, the people that are in power need to be also educated in what they're trying to do and what the importance of what they're doing is. So for example, one of the stuff I do at and City Hall Full Council where we've got the monthly big meetings is I literally bring in 
different creative acts. Like last time we had a creative scientist just to showcase the creative talent we've got. Next month I might have a poet, I might have a musician literally just come in and give a performance to all the decision makers. It'll be, it's in a weird environment because it's all very old building and it just is not, but at the same time it'll just be in their face and they'll try to literally get that message home. So it's education on both sides. I, I also think it's important to connect with the community where you want to do something, you know, not just come in, change uh, the place, like what you said about neighbors, but also about the youth. You we have, uh, we now occupy the space in uh, Amsterdam Southeast, where there's predominantly black, 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 black people live in. <laughs> and, uh, what we offered, we, we started a residency there and because we also think it's an interesting area for the white intellectual artist and also for the young people there to get more acquainted with other things than music and dance. Now I'm stereotyping, but that's the point. And what they do, they offer everybody free workshops based on their own practice. So I think that's also a good thing. Do you know one thing I'd also say is I'm, I'm really good tired tip. of all... Sorry, have you finished? Good tip, I said. Okay, brilliant, sorry. One thing I'm really tired of is always relying on other people to give us what we want. So I honestly think instead of always relying on politicians, because there's always that disconnect between the creative, the musicians and the poli and politicians, so why can't we get more creative standing as politicians and actually being the decision makers rather than always, oh, it's us versus them, where if we had more, I guess it's, I can play a role in that encouraging other people from different backgrounds, just basically diversifying the decision makers so they, we do have people who understand and actually care about what we're trying to do as a movement rather than always disengage and not connect to them. So if we can get more people to actually stand as politicians or just get involved... And, and also learn how to organize things. Hundred percent. Because it's not all fun and games. It's, it's not. also hard work to organize something, and Definitely. you have a, you need a group of people to throw themselves in and 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 take action. Yeah. And sometimes I feel maybe this is not the right audience for that, but sometimes I feel that is lacking a lot too. Mm. So everybody's waiting for someone else to organize it, and then they come party. It's like <laughs> no, it doesn't work like that. Or That's complain. Right. Party or complain. Yeah. No, I, I actually like the residencies thing a lot. And, you know, this used to work very well with us authors because, you know, we have, we have people sort of gather and discuss things and then have a party. But if you want a bunch of authors in the room, it's good to bring another author in from some other city and actually have him sleep in the house. It's just like, come over and be my guest. No, you're not going to be in the hotel. You're going to wake up. I'm going to, like, make you breakfast, okay? Because, like, you're my brother, you know? It's like, you're the sister from another town or another country. Just come over here and, like, sit down at the table with us, you know? And that seems to hit people on some visceral level that, like, no amount of grant swinging will ever do. I mean, you'll get people to agree to that arrangement who would, you know, demand a lot of money otherwise or make all kinds of trouble or say, talk to my agent or whatever. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's handy to have a place where you can stash people. And if it's your own house, yeah, even better. Well, and I have to say, actually, this is how I met you and Jasmina, right? Like, I came and crashed in your place. In it, it's a record of proven success, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> it saved me uh, from uh, quite a while, yeah? Okay, so we're yeah. going to have a lot of slumber parties after this event. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> Any more last question? This is the last question to our panelists about celebration and politics at... Nighttime. I have a question though. For uh, uh, just was that your question? I, I took your question a totally different way. I thought like how c I, I, in the in the construct of the club and the already there, how can you um, transcend the the po politics and the creativity? That wasn't part of your question. Am I projecting? No, it was it was linked. It was coming back to this idea that uh, yeah, it's coming back to this idea that. Uh, this kind of governmental and law and order right, like is shutting down and this bridge that's become too expanded to actually approach anymore. But I mean, how is that true though? Especially yeah, like a city in Amsterdam where you actually have a night mayor, which is no, probably it's very, the it's only very city. Uh, very I mean, true. Especially in Dutch society, Isn't, but can you not just reach out? Else. Can you not reach out to someone like Merrick? No, th th that's that's definitely possible. But like, I, f I think um, what he is also getting at is the 
um, the value that the squatting community brought to Amsterdam is often now neglected when they need help. Okay. And often those, yeah, often those worlds are, you know, um, uh, too, uh, too far apart. And yes, we, we try to help a little bit, uh, but um, um, when nobody can vote about it, nothing will change in the end. That's fucking gentrification for you. <laughs> Last question. Smoke those cigarettes. Um, yeah, so we, I don't know, we're talking here about like the creative industry and creative professionals sort of integrating themselves wider within like a wider industrial and political space um, with a certain sense of like inevitability that it's going to increase progressive thought and um, diversity and things like that. But in my opinion, there's a certain tension between creative space and industry and politics that actually creates the integrity of creativity and of art and also of its timelessness. So I'm wondering, one, what gives you the confidence that that's going to kind of carry through should the creative industries be sort of looked at on the same plane within a city's industrial apparatus or political apparatus? And two, um, what do you think or how do you think that would affect the ultimate integrity of the cre creativity as art and not just fall into a wider capitalistic space? Well, um, I, I had an a interview with Nelly before, and we were talking a lot about creativity and institutions. And um, it's very important, even if you're in the institution or you're in the space, and that's, I feel like, I, to always s subvert it in a way to like bring it back to the essence of it. So I, 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 what they do from the community, from the uh, like outward coming in, if I'm in that space already, I'm going to say what I want to say and I'm going to uh, say my piece and find out what's going on and, and what's in that there. So for me, that's, that's um, and, and I, I recognize it's a privilege because I have a platform, but I think it's my responsibility and I feel like it's the reason why I do what I want to do is to make sure that I'm, um, even if I'm in that institution, to like, not not, you know, shit on the stage just for the sake of it, but... Let's say there's a bathroom law where people aren't allowed, maybe then it's appropriate to do, you know, like some action that will, or some uh, words. But, but, but we also speak about the rules, you know, and you remember we had this. Yeah, we had a different uh, ideas about rules. You, rules were made to be broken, and I'm like, I'd rather just not have the rules and we <coughs> figure it out and find a different system instead of trying to pick those rules. I've got a couple of hacks that, that work for me there, you know, and, and I, I, I take your point in the question, but, you know, if you're really worried about being sort of surrounded by the system and outflanked and kind of recuperated, there are like two things you can do that work really well, and one is just like go on retreat. I mean, just leave and go like stay at a farmhouse for like six weeks where there's just like nobody around. You'll come back with some original ideas because, you know, there's just nobody else to talk to. And the other is just to go to another country. I mean, when you're a foreigner living among people, they're not going to recuperate you. They don't know how. I mean, they don't know how to push your buttons. And they don't know what you can do and what you can't do, and you don't know that either. How right? does that help your community? Uh, it doesn't. It just helps your integrity. <laughs> it doesn't help the community, it, but it, it helps, helps your integrity. You this question is about people's integrity. Yeah, right? right. The question is not about community, it's about integrity. I mean, if you're the community leader, you always end up being, I mean, those who worship the muses end up running the museum. You're going to end up being the curator eventually if it's all about the community. But if it's all about, you know, original ideas expressed with integrity, you just have to go off someplace where you people aren't yelling. You don't have to. You don't have to. You can also get in there. Get involved. It's a choice. Yeah. So I think we are going to uh, close this uh, second conversation and last conversation, actually, <laughs> of the night on this uh, beautiful note from Peaches that at the end of the day, it is about your choice, what you want to do about nightlife, celebration and politics, and uh, get involved in politics. 
I mean, I would love to hear how you got involved in politics as well, Majid, at 28 and actually managed to make it all the way to being a mayor, whether that has been a really rocky, um, you know, adventure or whether, you know, you... It's, um, in honest, I came from a sports background. I did MMA, mixed martial arts for a long time. And I had no idea about politics. I literally couldn't tell you about party politics, but I knew I cared about issues and specific causes. So I used to just campaign on whether that be free education, whether that be eradicating the hidden course cost of university to even like, like xenophobia and, and hate crime within Sheffield. And I think this, that led me to throw myself and be like, no, I actually want to make more of a difference, play more of an active role where I lived. And then decided to stand with the Green Party, even though everyone else I knew was Labour Party in Sheffield in the UK, just because I just wanted to play. They, a lot of their morals and kind of viewpoints kind of really aligned with mine. And nobody joins the Green Party in the UK to have a career in politics, to be honest. So it's very odd, the fact that the Green Party is a Lord Mayor as well, which is very strange. But I think that's just a testament to the people in Sheffield and the fact that we're really proud of doing things differently. And of course, it, was, it wasn't easy. It was difficult. There's a lot of barriers in the way, but... I was just kept pushing and just kicking the door down. I was like, I'm going to keep pushing and seeing what happens. And then, yeah, it's worked out. Were you, were you surprised when you won? Was it one of those like, Holy what? shit moments. Yeah, 100%. I was like, what the heck? But it's, I think, do you know, I think people just wanted to change. And I think a lot of people, I guess, put a lot of trust in me, yeah. which I'm really, and it comes with a lot of pressure, but it's a good kind of pressure, if I'm being honest. And yeah. so, did you, did on... There yeah. was this in, in uh, New York today, you know, there's this, um, uh, the demo, uh, uh, like, uh, maybe he was going to become the leader of the Democratic Party, Joe Crowley. Okay. And he lost to a 28-year-old uh, Latino um, left socialist. This fucking right. I think, people <laughs> are, I think people are starting to wise up to yeah. this. I think a lot of people are able to sift through the bullshit and actually get yeah. down to what matters. I think in this situation, she like went down to the border and was like, I'm going to help, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. all the Hands situation. On. And he was like, I'm, I'm for that, but I'm not going to go down to the border. And I think people you know? just want people that they can relate with and yeah. just are honest and exactly. that they can identify with. And so that's there's like not a, a lot of that in politics, fortunately. And for America and New York, that was a good... Yeah. Yeah. Woo. So there's more people like you out there. That's mm. it. So with Thank this you. inspirational story, please, a massive round of applause to our speakers. And these are small tokens of love. Some Coca-Cola, which has been handmade in Marcantina and the University of the Underground. Go and get your own Coca-Cola made. Oh, and I? join yourself. And uh, can we, um, well, and can we actually get, where is Sharon Minello? So, you know, we have amazing, amazing tutors in the University of the Underground. One of them is Sharon Minello, who is a theater tutor of the students down in the basement. And he teaches them all about the practice of opera in the context of the institution. And he wanted to do a piece of music to say and share his love for the students after quite an intensive year. So, massive round of applause for Sharon Minello, everyone. Sharon Minello! Tutor at the University of the Underground, Opera Director, all in one, incredible human being. And Sharon, when you're ready, we are ready. I have some Coca Cola here.